everybody. Good morning. I am very, very pleased to introduce a very special guest this morning, Pennsylvania's 46th governor. Governor Tom Corbett has been a real champion for Pennsylvania's children. In fact, he has invested more state funding in basic education than any other administration in Pennsylvania's history. And even during these challenging times, he has focused mightily on early childhood education, advocating not only for increased access to early care and education, but for increased quality. And we know, all know how important and essential that is. His compassion for children does not stop there. Governor Corbett is making certain that all Pennsylvanians are properly insured. This past September, Governor Corbett launched his Healthy PA initiative, a plan to ensure that all Pennsylvanians have access to affordable quality care. And just last week, Governor Corbett signed House Bill 108, reauthorizing, and this is important to this group, the Pennsylvania CHIP program, which also eliminated the six month waiting period for children. Most importantly, to add to all of these other credentials, Governor Corbett is a dedicated grandpa to his <laughs> grandson, Leo. Please join me in welcoming. Can you hear me in the back? There we go. Thank you. Gee, I hope you guys got me on film up there. Yeah, I, can, I can see little faces back there. Um, it is truly a pleasure, pleasure to be here. And uh, Bart kind of hit it. You know, we became uh, grandparents uh, two years ago when our daughter adopted a two-day-old uh, baby boy. And, uh, and, you know, the first time you become a grandparent, it's like, Okay, you have to look at my grandchild's pictures. And in this day and age, you know, you reach into your pocket, you pull out your smartphone or your iPhone, and I can go to his pictures, and my daughter sent me pictures about every third or fourth day uh, of that, and I make people look at them. If I could figure out how to get it up there real fast, I mean, you'd be having to look at it. I say I've got a thousand people. But I'm sure many of you know that, and those of you who aren't old enough to know that, uh, you'll you will understand it. I do want to thank you, particularly all of you that are here, for what you do every day for our children. Um, and it's for the children of Pennsylvania, but it's also for the children of the world, for the children uh, of our country. Because what it really is, it's for our future and for their future. Uh, whether you happen to be working in a classroom, or you're running the programs, uh, or educating those who are the thought leaders about the importance of early education, and including helping me educate the legislature about this. I'm grateful for the work that you have done and for your commitment. As I jump through my notes here, you now know Sue and I became parents, grandparents to young Liam. Now, okay, I'm gonna personalize this for a minute. Liam is going to be, in my mind, whatever he wants to be. And I'm sure you believe that about the children you work with and uh, your children and your grandchildren. Liam is going to be probably um, you know, a football player, a piano player, uh, a baseball player, a basketball player, uh, a chemist, whatever he wants to be. One of those reasons, two reasons, one is his imagination. 
And that's what you're here to talk about today, I think. His imagination. But two is his size. His birth mother is 5'11". His birth father is 68360. <laughs> he's two, he's this big. <laughs> and at 40 pounds, he's lean. I don't know how my daughter continues to carry it. We have a picture in here of him in my cell phone, reaching down and picking up and carrying what is probably, I'm going to guess, a seven to 10 pound pumpkin by the stench, with a very determined look on his face. And I'm going to come back to that pumpkin patch analogy here uh, in, in a moment. But this is just an evolution that we all go through, from not having children to having children, if we're lucky enough to have our own, or for people adopting, because I'm very proud of my daughter in this, to becoming grandparents but also to being members of society. You know, this is not my first excursion with children. You know, one of my first jobs in Harrisburg, I had been working with the Rich Administration, as many of you probably have worked with the administrations in an unpaid capacity. I was chairman of the Commission on Crime and Delinquency and the Governor Rich. And by the way, I was with him yesterday, and we talked about where I was coming, and he asked me to send his best to all of you for what you were doing. But we were working there, and I got involved in western Pennsylvania with the uh, United Way, some of the people focused there. Now this is early, this is about 95, 96. Some of you, I'm looking around, were still in high school. <laughs> some of you were a couple years out of high school. <laughs> some of you might have been out of college. <laughs> I was a father, I, was, I had just finished as U.S. Attorney in Pittsburgh. I had two children, one was in high school, one was in college. But I was working with the United Way who was looking at the issue of early childhood education in the early and mid 90s. How many of you here in this room, by the way, if you couldn't tell I was a teacher, you will by the end, because I believe in class participation. <laughs> How many of you were involved way back in 95, 96? Look at that, look around. This is a, this is a job. It's an avocation. It's a passion. So I was asked, since of the relationships I had, by a woman who continued to work with me for many years, to go to Harrisburg and try and talk to the administration and get money for the administration. Some of you are not even heads, you remember this. <laughs> and the sum of money they were asking for for one county was a little high. I'm not going to say what it was, but it was a little high in, in, in those days. Uh, and for one county, it would probably still be a little high. Uh, and I was trying to educate in, in both directions. But she and her husband became friends. Uh, they are still friends of ours. Marty Eisler. Probably many of you know who Marty Eisler is. She's not with us here today, but I wish she was, because she ignited my interest in this. Uh, and what we need to understand. Frankly, not what you need to understand, but what we in government, what we in the legislature, no, they in the legislature, <laughs> need to understand. That we need to give our children access to quality, quality educational opportunities, and that the possibility that this creates for the children's future, excuse me, the future. And it's something that I will continue to work with as long as I have the ability to work with that and continue to do it throughout my career. Um, but now, it's reignited in me because I watch Lee. And as I said, he's going to be whatever he wants to be. He, uh, I've watched him learn differently than we learned. Think about back when you were four or five. That's probably as far back as you when I was five, I actually lived in Harrisburg. And I can remember going down to the apartment building where we had a, a, co they had a coffee shop or a lunch bar, or whatever you want to call, call it. And they had a pinball machine. And I was the pinball wizard at first. <laughs> that was one of my ways of learning. And maybe a little bit of television. Howdy doody and so forth. 
But think about what Liam learns today when he grabs my daughter's cell phone. He knows where to hit it at the age of two to play the song Moves Like Jagger. <laughs> and he starts dancing to it. And actually, she did it for him when he was one year old. He was out there. And now he, he does it on his own. And the ability to take laptops, the exposure not just to the block that they live on or the neighborhood, but to the entire world. Think about the endless possibilities for their imagination. So it's much different than when we grew up. It's a greater challenge, but it's so much more potential. I see him use his technology, and I'm just marveling whether he is back in that pumpkin patch doing things that we did, trying to lift pumpkins, or maybe he's working on a pumpkin, not carving it, working and moving it around on, a, on an iPad. And you can see that little mind, I shouldn't say little, that big mind in that little body working, wondering. Not being able to communicate necessarily to us, except in very simple phrases, but learning. And if that isn't a magical moment for you as a grandparent or a parent or just an interested adult, then we need to have conversations <laughs> because it is. And it's that magical moment with every child. Every child has that moment. In fact, I would say that in our children, the impulse to learn is probably one of our greatest human gifts. We need what you do and what we do in government to honor them and to see that possibility in every one of our children. So I thought that the, today's theme uh, of this event is perfect. We need to ignite imaginations. Now, I'm not quite sure how you came up with that, but I like it. But I am not quite sure whose imagination you're talking about. Because I don't think we need to ignite a child's imagination. I think we need to ignite an adult's imagination of what is possible. just need to free the imagination of the children as to where they're going to be. Um, you know, I can stand here and I will for a moment and say, we, we all know what the studies are. This is preaching to the choir. And the choir needs to go out and sing this, and I know you do. But you need to help me with the legislature on this, where we spent money. We could talk about every dollar spent educating a pre-K child comes back to us up to sevenfold. Or that more early learning children graduate from high school, fewer of them go to prison, and I certainly know that from my prior roles as attorney general, U.S. attorney, assistant district attorney. And they become productive citizens. That really is clearly evident. But it isn't simply an economic issue or community issue. I know you agree with me. It's a moral obligation that we have to our future generations. These are the children of Pennsylvania. These are the children of the United States. And they are the children of the world. They are the future. And if the idea of making each young life better doesn't ignite our adult imagination, to help them soar, to make them great. Then what are we doing here? The problem is, I'd like to see this room four times as big and four times as full. And that's what you're here for. To go out there and sing that song to the general population. Every day, we have to strive for excellence for our children. And as governor, I've had the unique ability to continue to honor the commitment that I started back in the 90s to early learning. And that's why, I think, uh, Barb, you mentioned this. This year's state budget that we're in right now, this fiscal year, we included $23 million to increase funding for early education programs. It's a $23 million increase. Now, I will tell you that's not quite as high as what Marty Eisner wanted in 1995. <laughs> not even close. Not even close, I understand. But it's baby steps. 
That money can go to programs such as our pre-K, Pennsylvania's pre-K counts, our Head Start, Head Start Supplemental Assistance, and our Early Intervention Program. By doing that, it results in nearly 2,300 more children in Pennsylvania gaining access to early quality childhood education. It's also why we have started a new program, the Rising Stars Program, as part of Keystone Stars. This will promote access to higher quality early childhood education programs, especially for our most adverse children. This is for you. This is for the people at the pre-K programs. That's why I'm excited to be here today, though, with some additional news. Today, I'm pleased to announce that the creation of the Rising Stars Tuition Assistance Program for all of you and for other educators across Pennsylvania. This very unique program builds upon the existing tuition voucher program, but addresses the barriers that many of you have told us uh, and have shared with us that you see as barriers to this education. Instead of reimbursing you after the fact, after you've taken the course, I know how slow sometimes state government is in getting people reimbursed. Anybody have a problem with that? <laughs> <laughs> I heard some stuff. We now will be paying you 95% of your tuition in advance. As I said earlier, we can rattle off the studies 
talk about the statistics and prove the value of early learning. You all know this. And show the outcomes when these children become adults. But let's not forget about what these programs do for our children right now. Do for the Liams and the Marys and the Bills and the Lisas. Our children don't exist in a future plan. They're here right now. They don't function in the future, they function in the present. They live here and now, but we need to reach them here. And if not now, when? <coughs> That's why you can't tell. I'm going to repeat. I believe in early childhood education, and I always have. Not only for what it does for the future, but for the children who need us right now. Let me end with this. I've changed the speech many times during the course of the speech. Let me challenge you. Let's ignite, as I said before, our own imaginations here and in going into the future so that we can free the imagination of a two or a three or a four or a five year so that when they go to kindergarten, when they go to first grade and second grade, they are not only prepared to go there, they are anxious, they are ready, and they want to challenge their teacher to have imagination also. Thank you for letting me join you today.